um, and before we, we we delve into the scripture uh i think this is it just comes at a really interesting time at the moment because uh if you follow any christian press either uh, as a newspaper or whether you uh, follow the christian church of england or sort of well-known christian uh, instagrammers social media accounts whatever even the church times you're just seeing a fairly significant uh, statement by lots of people about someone who was in leadership in the church of england who sadly is under investigation now uh, and that impacts us because I can remember a few years ago now the leader of New Wine at the time being removed from the leader of New Wine and being removed from his job as a vicar because of an inappropriate relationship with someone else from his church while he was uh, while he was married and that impacts us doesn't it because you look at these people and you think well they're significant leaders and actually all of them have had impact in my life and somehow we get ourselves emotionally attached to them and then when they fall it impacts us, even though you know I don't really know any of them personally. It still has uh, an ability to impact us, uh, be, uh, and I think that's quite interesting in, in many ways. I think there's a sort of reflection to be had there about how uh, how connected I suppose we are, and how uh, how uh, invested we are in these people. That when we see them have sort of moral failures or whatever it actually affects us in significant ways. But I think what's really interesting in them is that it would appear that God has done what God does really best through the ministries. And, and it, it looks like there is, there's been a sort of catalogue, what we can I, I don't want to be making judgment, but it looks like there's been an issue around uh, safeguarding for some time. But nonetheless, God still used the ministry and still blesses, blessed, the ministry in a in a significant way and lots of people have been impacted blessed and and nurtured and discipled as a result of it and i think that's that's something of the nature of god and i think that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today the fact is we're all broken we're all vulnerable we're all hurting and yet god still chooses to use us with our brokenness and our frailty not that necessarily we need to celebrate that but we recognizing it is really significant uh, so just to recap for where we are for those of you that were helping out with young people this morning uh, we looked at we started to look at King David and we looked at his uh, him being chosen uh, and the fact is that uh, Samuel had uh, been asked to come and uh, anoint David uh, Samuel was in mourning so we talked about the fact that we need to move on there are times when God's doing a new thing and we actually need to move on from, from whatever it is we're in and leave the past behind and move on Samuel uh, Samuel was also scared because you know Saul was a powerful king uh, and God was going to remove him and got and Samuel had that Samuel had the unfortunate job of anointing the new king while there was a current one on the throne and a powerful one at that uh, and so he was a bit scared, but God then nonetheless wanted him to move on. You know, stop standing, staying in the place where you are. Stop living in the past. I'm doing a new thing. You need to come with me on this. Uh, and then we looked at the sort of character of David and did a bit of a compare and contrast between David and Saul. Hello. Uh, and the fact that Saul was, uh, when we first meet Saul, he is looking for the donkeys because his dad's donkeys had gone missing. So clearly not very good at keeping an eye on the flock, as it were. Whereas David was the amazing shepherd and and but also this man who who worshipped God in that place of uh, insignificance who worshipped God in the place of being unseen and all of these characteristics someone who's prepared to fight for what he's been given uh, the shepherd role the person who was prepared to do the task of looking after the sheep uh, because that's what he's been given to do and not come and seek the greatness of trying to find the prophet that was come to to town the person who in the quiet place worshipped God when he wasn't seen, who, who poured out his heart and sung praise and worship even when uh, nobody else other than the sheep were looking. And that was the sort of character that God saw and said, that's the person I want to become a king. And, and how actually perhaps that's, there's some lessons for us to reflect on there. And, and actually our, front, our, our, the, our presented persona has to match the uh, the the quiet back room of our life what goes on behind actually empowers what should come up the front and perhaps at times they're not aligned uh, so we're going to move on 
there's actually quite a lot of scripture to cover on this. So I'm going to read bits rather than all of it, because otherwise we'd be into the barbecue. You'll be getting hungry and we'll still be reading the story of David and Bathsheba and uh, and then uh, Nathan's uh, rebuke of David. So if you've got your Bibles, you want to flick to Second Samuel. We're going to start at chapter 11. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the t- on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman washing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent some messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was puring herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she, then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Now we, we know the rest of that story. It doesn't go well. David uh, panics and then plots a way to try and cover up his mistakes and it ended up killing, having Uriah killed. And we're going to jump ahead to uh, uh, chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan, another prophet, to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except for one little ewe lamb that he brought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, He took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you. And your master's wives into your arms. I gave all. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Hello. <laughs> IT support to Keith, please. <laughs> okay. Um, what we end up going on to see is that there's a consequence for this, and actually, the this, this, the child that's uh, that's uh, that is the result of David and Bathsheba's uh, indiscretion uh, is, uh, is, uh, is 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 dies, and uh, uh, as a consequence for their actions. Anyway, so. I want to look at this passage because I think it's quite interesting. We can, I think there's some things for us to learn from this. Uh, because I think there is a general sense of, of uneasiness, of being let down when leaders fall in public sin. We've, and we've seen it, as I said, in the life of the church quite recently. But it's interesting, isn't it, that it's a story nearly as old as creation itself. Nearly. Three chapters, perhaps, as old as as creation itself. So what can we learn from this? What, what is there? I think there's, there's sort of two ways I'm going to uh, sort of look at it. One is, how do we try and stop this from happening? What do we learn from David in the first place that made us think, well, actually, he made some errors that got him in this mess in the first place. And then when we find ourselves in messes, what do we do? Now, it strikes me that as we, we start chapter 11, that David was already well on his way to the inevitability of this. Uh, you may dispute that, but it seems to me that the adultery uh, was already s- sort of on track. 
because he'd start to let his heart and his eyes wander. He, he actually started, then if you noticed, he started to take his eyes off his purpose and his calling. We looked at earlier, what had God called him to? God had called him to lead his people. He was a man who was supposed to be a shepherd, to shepherd his people, but also he was brave. He was supposed to look after his people. He was the one that fought lions and bears when the sheep were attacked. He was supposed to be this courageous, brave shepherd to look after his people. Uh, what's, what's, it's a funny little line that you get here in the beginning of this chapter that says, uh, at, in the spring, the time when kings go off to war. Now, that's, that's quite strange, isn't it? That's a really odd thing to say. It's, an, it's, a, it's a weird sort of diary entry in the kingly diary every year. Spring must go off to war. Uh, but it would, and I certainly wouldn't advocate war as a great distraction technique for, 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 uh, for potential sin in your life. That would be rather extreme. Yeah, but it, what's, what seems to, that the writer seems to be saying here is that actually David's kingly duty at the time was to lead his army. That was what he was called to do. And his army had gone out to fight. David was supposed to be this brave, mighty uh, shepherd of his people and as the leader he was supposed to be at the front of them leading them into battle because actually there's a sort of representation in the life of David about the sort of the the, the growth of Israel and the growth of the kingdom and, and actually the kingdom is supposed to expand uh, and David uh, certainly pushed the boundaries of Israel significantly and, and, and was very victorious and conquered lots of lands uh, around him. And, and Israel was a vast uh, piece of uh, real estate in those days. Uh, and he was incredibly powerful. And he should have been leading his people. He should have been leading his army at the time. Because that was his calling as the king. And yet he's nowhere to be seen in the battle. He's back in Jerusalem. So it strikes me right at the beginning of this story, he's already taken off, his eyes off the role that God had called him to. I've called you to lead my people. I've called you to be their king, their monarch. And that means, to lead means to be at the front. To be at the front of the people. That's what leadership is. Dictators send people. Leaders lead them. And David is back in Jerusalem saying, go off and fight my battles for me. David is back in the comfort and the security. He's not taking the risk here. His soldiers are the ones that are taking the risk. And he's just sent them off. It strikes me that, that his first failing is here. He's, he's lost his sense of identity. He's lost his very purpose, what he's supposed to be doing as the king. That's leading his people. That's why he was... Uh, he was uh, called and he's lost sight of this and when we lose sight of the calling that God's given us we open ourselves up actually to temptation and if you ever thought about that if God's called you to something when we take our eyes off of that our, our eyes very easily wander and if David had just been focused on this thing, you've called, I've called, you've, you know, I've called you, David, to lead my people to be the king, to go out and fight. He would have been very focused on winning a battle. As it is, he'd lost sight of his calling and his eyes started to wander. And that's, the, that's so often the case, I think. When we, when we lose sight of the very thing that we're called and entrusted to do, our eyes can wander. And, and David's eyes were wandering. I, don't sus I, I can't s sort of see... That in this story, this was the first time David had gone up for a little walk on the, it doesn't say, I, I'm speculating, at night on the roof. He was supposed to be fighting a battle. He's walking on the roof and there he sees this beautiful lady on the other side. And even then he has a choice, doesn't he? You know, if you see something, your eyes inadvertently see something which you shouldn't do, you have a choice at that point, don't you? You have the choice, do I avert my eyes and go, actually, I shouldn't be looking at that. Or do I look a little bit longer and let my eyes linger in that place for a little bit too long, an inappropriately le lo uh, sort of length of time? And David was falling into that category. And then when he was in that category, he started to look. And instead of averting his eyes and go, oh, crikey, what am I doing? I shouldn't be looking at that. He started to look. And when he started to look, he started to lust. 
And then he, he asked, who is that? Who is that? And they came back, well, that's Bathsheba. She is the wife of Uriah. And, in, and even then he has a choice. He has a choice of, oh, she's married. I can't, that's not for me. She is already uh, married and in a relationship. She is now out of bounds. He makes the choice, I'll, I'll have her around for tea. <laughs> that's a good plan. You know, he's, he's starting to, I'm sure it's a, it's a sort of slow trickle, isn't it? He's probably convincing himself all the way along. Oh, well, Uriah's out fighting the battles. I'll have her over because that's the friendly thing to do. But I'm, I'm sure his head's already in the place of, well, if I have her over for tea, uh, for whatever, then, you know, things might lead on to something else. And that's exactly what happens. Things do lead on to something else. And as a result, she falls pregnant. So the first lesson, don't get distracted from what God's given you to do. The second thing, when you start to see your eyes wandering, avert your eyes. When you start to feel yourselves going into that place of temptation, stop it. Don't let your eyes linger. Don't pursue that path. Because actually, uh, the, the Spirit of God in, inside us is a, voice of God's is a voice of God, like our conscience, calling to us and saying, you should stop this. And you, that's the choice we have, isn't it? That's, what, that's the choice we have in our lives as Christians, as followers of Jesus. Do we, do we listen to that voice or do we, do we listen to the voice of the temptation? And it's hard because if temptation wasn't tempting, it wouldn't be called temptation. It would be called something else, like horrible or something. But the fact is, it is tempting, because that's why it's called temptation. It's, it is something that's appealing to you, otherwise you wouldn't have a problem refusing it. And David just kept pursuing this path. You know, he could have not looked. He could have then not asked, who is she? And then even when finding out, he then could have said, he could have not asked her over, go and get her, bring her to me. All of these points, he had the opportunity to stop, and he doesn't. And then what happens is he then gets trapped because sin is sticky. It sticks a lot. And it traps you. That's why Jesus you know, talks about, I've come to set you free. Not because we're all in physical prisons, but because we're all physically trapped within something. We're all caged, we're all chained, we're all bound. That image again in the, in the Christmas Carol, that, that the, you know, they can't see, Mar Scrooge can't see, but Marley says, you can't see Scrooge, but actually the chains you carry are even greater than these. And Scrooge is already trapped in his sin. So, uh, but, uh, but, uh, and at this point, David again has a choice. And he, and he makes the wrong one. And, and we see here consequence of our sin. It, it impacts other people. Because we live in community. It doesn't just affect our relationship with God and sin breaks it. It's an you know, incredibly disruptive and, and a thing with our relationship with God. It actually breaks our relationship with other people. It destroys that as well, which is just as, equally as heartbreaking for God because actually we were born to be in relationship with him and with other people and with ourselves and with creation and sin destroys all of those relationships. David has a choice here. Well, I can either start to put things in place, but he makes the, another mistake. What does he try to do at this point? You know, there's a baby on its way now. He's whether he likes it or not, there is a life has been made. What is the choice? I can repent at this time, come clean, or I can cover it up. And he makes the mistake of saying, I'm going to try and cover this up. The problem with it, there's, there's only one, there's, there's sort of one path he takes in this one. And what we see is one life's been created and one life's taken to cover up. He takes the life of Uriah, doesn't he? You know, he, he, he tries, 
through deception first to get Uriah and his and Bathsheba back together again and says, well, let's, if we do this, we're all can cover it up. And then, then you'll, nobody will know it's me. And that doesn't work because actually Uriah is a faithful man. Uriah is a man who understands what he's been called to do. Uriah is, I know he said at the moment, I'm called to be in your army. I'm not going to go back to my wife because none of the other soldiers are. And I'm going to stay with the thing that I'm called to. And that's just rubbing salt into David's wound because David knows actually that's is where, exactly where he should be at the moment. He should be out with his soldiers. But instead, he's trying to cover up his mistakes. And so eventually he ends up when he says, well, we'll have to hit him bumped off. Because if he's bumped off, I can marry her and then we can cover it up again. He's trying to keep it under the radar. How many of us try and do that with our indiscretions in life? Why is that? Because we actually we don't want to look like people that make mistakes. Do we? We want... I mean, this was a really spectacular mistake as well. If we, if, as mistakes go, you know, adultery and murder. But it, he doesn't want people to find out. He's really ashamed because sin and shame are intrinsically linked. And, and you know, the, the, the Satan traps us in sin through the chains, uh, and, and then once we're, in the, we're trapped in sin, he then binds us in shame. So we don't just feel bad because we've done something wrong. We feel really bad because we don't want other people to know about it. So it's like a double whammy as well, because people will go, oh, if, uh, you know, you think you're there thinking, if only they knew the type of person that I really am. You know, I'm, I was called to be the king of Israel, and I'm actually... You know, I'm, I, I, I'm lustful, I'm, I, at this point I'm lustful, I'm lazy, I've committed adultery, and now I've committed murder. If people knew that about me, what are they going to think of me as king? So he covers it up. And he has opportunities to do the right thing, but he chooses not to. He just instead, you know, and there's something about this, isn't it, uh, that says when you're in a hole, stop digging. And he doesn't, he carries on digging, he goes, well, if I keep digging, I'm going to dig my way out of this. Well, holes, you never dig your way out of a hole, you just dig the hole deeper. That's what digging does. And he just keeps digging deeper and deeper and deeper in this hole of sin. And he just keeps getting more and more shamed by the whole thing. Uh, and, and, until, uh, you know, he's left in this position of needing to be confronted. So the Lord says, I'm going to send a prophet because the Lord sends prophets to people because the Lord loves sending prophets to his people because he wants to bring them back on track. And the prophets are not there to, 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 to smack you over the head and say, you are a naughty person. The prophets are there to, to, to say, God th knows, God sees, and God thinks you can do better. So get back on track. So he sends Nathan, and, and, and uh, this is, this is uh, Prophet Nathan that goes to him. And Nathan uh, decides to tell a story. And I quite like this story. Have you ever seen the Veggie Tales story of this? It's great. <laughs> little, she little sheep, a little shepherd boy. And it's, it's, it's delightful. But anyway, that's the story, isn't it? There's, a, little, there's a, a man who has this little sheep. He completely dotes on the sheep. It's like it, it's literally treated as a child for him. He, and, and, and there's this other man who's so wealthy, he's got sheep coming out of his ears. Uh, 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 and Nathan's telling this story, and David's going, oh. That's it. It's, you can see David's getting really... Uh, uh, getting drawn into this story because David doesn't think it's just a story. David thinks that Nathan is giving him like news. David thinks that Nathan's actually saying, this has happened. You're the king. What are you going to do about it? You know, like some news report. And David says, that is awful. He needs to be dealt with. And then Nathan comes in with a killer line. Yes, you're right. He needs to be dealt with, King David. And guess what? It's you. And God has seen you, David. God has seen you. And so that you know he's seen you, he sent me to tell you. He's seen you. And there are consequences for this, David. Your son, as a result of this, will die. 
That was sufficient to kick David into action. David then thinks, oh my word, I've been caught. And, and again, you have two choices when you've been caught out. You can go, it's a fair cop, or you can go, it wasn't me. David chose the right path at this and go, it's a fair cop. He could have gone into Delilah and go, I don't know what you're talking about, Nathan. You, you, you let, I think we should stone you because there is something in the Bible about false prophets being stoned. And that's just not true. Let's stone and get remove Nathan from the story as well. He doesn't. He goes, it's a fair cop. And David's actions there finally come to the point which he should have done way back at the beginning of the story. David starts to repent. He fasts and he prays and he cries out to God for the life of his son. But the son dies. The son dies as a result of it. And then David gets up. And recognizes. To, he, I mean, he doesn't say this, but he, he's, he's, there's a sort of implication in the com, in, in this uh, exchange, this this communication, similar to the the Job thing, where the Lord gives and He takes away. And actually, the Lord has taken away here. I thought He was going to be. I, I I pleaded to Him to be gracious, but He's removed Him. And why? I mean, that's that's the, the, there's tension in here, isn't there? There's a theological tension that exists in that statement. If, if you don't see it, then I'd like you to explain why you're not questioning the character of God in this. Because God has just removed the life of the baby, the boy, even though David is now repenting. There is tension to be had in that. And that comes as, you know, that does bring us back to the book of Job. Well, actually, the Lord gives and he takes away. And the book of Job ultimately says, and we don't know why. But we do know that God, that's God's decision. And God is good. And we, ha and we don't know why he does these things. And that's the tension that exists in this story. And we have, to, we have to wrestle with that as Christians. Well, actually, we don't understand why things, why bad things happen to what appear to be innocent people. This boy is not a problem. Not, it is not his fault that he's been born as a result of adultery. It's David's fault, and probably a little bit of Bathsheba's, but you know, women, unfortunately, in those days were regarded a bit more as property. So we'll, it's certainly David's fault. He was the one in power, the position of power in this relationship, wasn't he? So there's tension to be had. And as Christians, we need to learn to live in tension. If you don't, you're always going to struggle to answer some of the really difficult questions the Bible throws at you. And you can come up with really glib answers, but let me tell you, they're normally inaccurate and they're really unhelpful. Because most of the time, we have to understand that God appears to allow things to happen that are not what we would regard as kind, loving, good, gracious, generous, abundant, loving, and all of those things. But that is the character of God. And so it leaves us with a tension in our theology of why? And I don't know. I can't answer that one because greater theologians than me can't either. So I'll leave that one with you. That's a freebie. But what we do see here is that, that so God, you know, God gives and he takes away. He's taken away this, this boy, but he does give as well. Uriah is now out of the way. David sort of legally enters into a relationship with Bathsheba and Solomon as a result. God gives David Solomon who will then take over uh, the throne from David. But there's been a scar left on David as a result of this. Because sin can leave scars in our lives, and it can leave scars in our ministry as well. The, you know, David's rule as king was not quite the same as a result of this ever again. And again, why that happens, I don't know. But you go and ask any, uh, anyone from any Jew and say, tell me, tell me, who's your greatest king? They will say, David. 
David is the greatest king in the Old Testament. He was the one that sought after the heart of God. He expanded the kingdom. But David lived with failure because David was human. But there are some lessons that we can learn because we all live with failure. Yeah, I live with failure in my life. There are some lessons that, you know, I, and I, have, I find that there are times when my head wanders into things that it shouldn't. And often, that's, I find it's when I'm just not as close to God as perhaps I should be. You know, because I think what happens is when we're close to God, God, so, you know, when we're walking with God, God's sort of saying, look, look at me, look at me, look at me. And when you're looking at God, your eyes don't wander off onto anything else because actually when you're looking at God, you're just going, wow. All the time. It's the image of, the, of revelation, isn't it? What the, 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 the elders, when they see the, the, the face of God, and they're seeing the face of God constantly, every time they look at him, they go, wow, fall on the holy, 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 fall, fall on their faces. And they get up again as though it's a completely new revelation, and they fall on their faces again. Why? Because he's just so, Wow. You take your eyes off of him. When you're not walking with him so close, your eyes can wander. So, you know, learn. Learn to, you, I mean, we, we're not stupid. Aren't we? we know those times when actually we could perhaps be a little bit more attentive to God in our lives, when perhaps we're not investing the quality time with him. And, and when we do that, we, we sort of convince ourselves, well, it's okay. Well, it's not. Because when we're not investing those quality times, that's actually the time when temptation, is, is, when we, we actually leave the door open for Satan to put his foot in and go, thanks very much. I've got my foot in there now. But when we're looking at God, there's, there is literally no boot space left for Satan to tempt. Because Satan is not as interesting as God. He's just not. But here is the good news. The cross works. Why? I'll tell you what my uh, New Testament lecturer said. When I was at St. John's, there was the, the big thing going on at St. while we were at St. John's, the th theological discussion about... Uh, 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 so the sort of atonement and, and, and uh, a sort of classic evangelical understanding is that God sent Jesus to, uh, to be our sort of substitute, sort of substitutional atonement. He takes our place. Well, that's not the only model of the, of the atonement. There are other models that work for the atonement. Uh, and and uh, some evangelical leaders, uh, Steve Chalk has said that's divine child abuse. You know, that God would send a child to die on behalf of you. Uh, and so there was a big debate going on at the time. And we, we got uh, Tom uh, Wright to come down to St. John's to talk to us at St. John's. And uh, he was talking about it as well. Uh, and, and, it's, and shall I tell you what the, the answer is to this? I don't know. But the atonement does work. But we don't know how. And it doesn't really matter. What matters is that it does. And if you're looking for a, a model... All models are slightly broken, but the atonement works. The atonement works. Sin can be dealt with. Sin, sin was ultimately dealt with on the cross. And sin does not preclude you from the things of God. Choosing to stay in sin will do. But God does work for good in all situations. That... I think, is something that we can take away from the story of David and Bathsheba. He was a great leader, but he was broken and he was flawed and he continued to make bad choices, which just made the sin grow. And the, the thing is, we have a choice, don't we? When we read these stories, we can go, oh, that's a really great story and we know where it's going and we know how it ends. Or we can actually look at that story and go... Where can I see myself in this story and what can I learn? When, when, what, what point do I, do, I, do I actually learn the lesson from David and go, right, I'm not going walking on the roofs any longer in, on, a, on, a, on an evening, metaphorically, because that's a really dangerous place for me. Because I know when I walk on the roofs on, the, on a Saturday evening, uh, my eyes wander onto things that they shouldn't be. That's, that's what we learn from these stories, isn't it? Or... Actually, my calling is to be doing this. So don't be lazy. 
Don't stay back in Jerusalem, putting your feet up and send someone else to do it. If you're called to lead the people, lead the people. Go and fight your wars with the soldiers. You know, whatever your calling is in life, stick to your calling because that's where you'll find the presence of God in your life. And then what? <laughs> and then I think if if you take nothing else away from this, when you're in a hole, for goodness' sake, just stop digging. Fess up. <coughs> Confess. You know, how many people, if we're entirely honest, I'm going to ask for a show of hands, I don't normally do this. How many people with our politics at the state as it is at the moment would rather, in Prime Minister's question time, when they're asked a question that they don't like, go, actually, do you know what? I'm going to put my hands up. I don't know. Or, actually, you're right. We haven't done well on that. How many people would much rather have that level of integrity and honesty with our politicians than the, the nonsense that we get in Parliament? Than the dodge the question and say something stupid back answer? No, we'd much rather people go, actually, I got it wrong. Because we'd go, wow, a man or a woman of integrity. Because when you acknowledge you got it wrong, you can work for that, can't you? So when you're in a hole, stop digging. Put your hands up. Confess. And I think the point that I'd not made, but I will make it. Do you know what? We need people like Nathan in our lives. People who have that level of relationship and authority to speak into our lives. To say, do you know what, David? Even if they tell silly stories about sheep. David, God sees and he's not happy. We need people that sort of level of accountability in our lives that are just going to hold us, ask the difficult questions. You know, and, and they're the sort of people, uh, if you're David, David should have been saying to Nathan a little while earlier, Nathan, I really, you know, I struggle when I go walking on the roofs in the evening because my eyes wanders onto things that I shouldn't be looking at. And Nathan can then say, and every time he sees David, he goes, How's your evening walks, David? Are you still walking on the roofs or are you doing something else? Are you, still do are you doing something better? You know, that's the sort of accountability we need, isn't it, in our lives? But David doesn't do that. Why? David's proud. Ultimately, he's king, isn't he? He's a, pr he's a proud leader and he's not prepared to ask for that level of accountability. And his pride, unfortunately, leads to his fall.